So uh, welcome everyone. I appreciate everyone uh, attending the uh, extremely exciting international trends in economic crime as of February 8th at 2, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. So um, to those that are uh, listening to this maybe later via recording, um, you know, I always welcome follow up and feedback and, and uh, questions uh, as well. So uh, welcome to you that are listening to this later and welcome to those that are listening to this live. So what, what my hope is to kind of discuss the um, global landscape of economic crime uh, as, uh, again, as I, as I see it. So uh, I guess I'll start with just a little background uh, of, uh, of myself, which will kind of lead into uh, kind of where all this information is, uh, is coming from on these international trends. So uh, I worked 22 years uh, in, in economic crime. I worked for two different uh, financial uh, private sector companies in their special investigations unit. Uh, I worked all the way uh, from field investigator all the way into uh, director uh, director roles. So I kind of saw a little bit of a uh, little bit of everything uh, on that on that front. Uh, and then I transitioned uh, about a year and a half ago uh, into an international role as vice president of international counter fraud strategies for a company called Inform. And what we do is we provide uh, solutions for companies, uh, private, public sector. Uh, we do military work uh, and uh, law enforcement as well. So we basically help them. Uh, we call it kind of uh, fill the gaps, uh, <laughs> if you will, or find the band-aids. And, uh, you know, we look for vulnerabilities uh, in these companies and agencies. And what we do is we, uh, we provide solutions, uh, solutions for them, uh, whether it be uh, personnel or uh, technology or a combination of, uh, of those things. So uh, that's basically my role now. Um, and during, during my, uh, uh, my career, uh, of course, I've, I've had the opportunity to investigate some, uh, uh, some very, um, very in-depth cases that, that have, have operated on an inter international basis uh, with organized crime uh, and, uh, and with a little uh, mom and pop shops, we call them. So uh, it's, uh, it's afforded me the opportunity to kind of see the, the bigger picture, both on the um, quality of, uh, of the crimes and also uh, the, the location. Uh, so, uh, so what I hope is to, to take all those uh, uh, kind of uh, practical examples and, and in, insert them into a presentation on kind of what's going on in the world of, uh, of, uh, of economic crime. So, and uh, welcome uh, in, in the chat as well. Um, so whatever questions you have, please stop me as I go through and uh, um, definitely, uh, definitely appreciate the, uh, the interaction. So, so let's uh, start off here. Okay, so here is Colorado State University Global Campus. Um, this is uh, where we're going to start our, our journey uh, on international fraud, and we're going to kind of travel around the world a little bit. So this is where we'll start to uh, start and end. So here is, um, and I apologize with the bandwidth; it might take a couple seconds here to uh, to uh, clear up. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with some some basic. Uh, basic overview on, on economic crime and, and kind of where it is. Uh, and then what, I, what I'd like to do is just discuss a little bit about uh, the, the psychological aspects of crime and, and what makes white collar criminals different than regular criminals. And what we, what we do in a lot of our training sessions and our consultations is we, we, really, we really have to um, uh, really differentiate and really educate uh, our, our clients and folks in the public and even even those in academics that there is a very distinctive difference and 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 that that requires different approaches uh, different preventative uh, measures so uh, that's just one thing to keep in mind uh, throughout the presentation one of kind of the main points I'd like to make um, is that difference so we're going to explore that uh, uh, at, at the start here uh, and then move into the specific uh, specific country so so what's interesting here is what we see, um, you know, th this is the global landscape. So these are areas where economic crime uh, is the highest, okay? 
So we have, uh, you know, North America, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Africa, Latin America. So what's really interesting is if you look at these uh, at these percentages, um, there is a reason why each of these have made this map. Um, and, and they're on here really for different reasons. And that's what I find very interesting when you look at this at such a global uh, global landscape. So, for example, in North America, 41 percent, you know, we, we made the map here. Um, so, so the question is, OK, why are we? Uh, why, why are we here? Why are we such a uh, enticing uh, area uh, for economic crime? And really, it comes down to, for us, our pocketbook. Okay, so there is a lot of resources, a lot of money um, in North America for the criminal element to target. So they see this. They look at these global, uh, you know, the global economies. And, and, and uh, you know, a lot of these, and what we're going to learn is a lot of these these scams and, and schemes are fueled by organized crime and uh, um, you know and terrorist cells. Um, they, they, you know we've, we've had cases where we've actually tracked you know very uh, small we call them small scale fraudulent cases in, in in a remote area in upstate New York all the way back into areas of the Middle East, um, so that funding uh, can be followed. But but here, what's interesting is you know we see in North America again we we you know we are such a, a rich country that the criminal element sees this. This is what makes us uh, um, you know such a uh, enticing target uh, to to the element. Uh, we have areas um, Latin America, let's say and even Africa, where we have we have high corruption. Um, we have a lot of um, uh, or I should say a lack of regulatory. Uh, issues in a regulatory environment to to assist you know insurance companies, private and public sector uh, in that endeavor. So really, it's it's very difficult for companies to investigate and 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 you know showcase strong efforts when at their core, you know, if if we get to a a case or if we get to a situation where we might have to prosecute or we might need law enforcement or um, other cooperation. Uh, if we know that that might not happen, uh, then, then this could definitely have an effect on, on their preventative approach. So, so in areas uh, where, where we have high, um, you know, high corruption and, and um, you know, uh, kickback schemes and things like that, these become vulnerable, uh, vulnerable areas. We have uh, areas of, of Asia. What's interesting is, is operating in the economic crime uh, uh, environment there is we have a lot of cultural aspects uh, in Asia. We've, uh, I've dealt with, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but, but we've, uh, uh, we're working on a consultation right now where uh, the company basically uh, is, is very resistant to actually seeing the, the, the fraud that we're showing them. And it, it's, it's, it's more of a cultural thing with, with, in these areas. And, and this becomes part, again, of, of an education process that we have to uh, undertake uh, uh, with them. So each of these is a specific story that we could spend, uh, you know, a whole day talking about. But again, this is the global landscape. This is where the highest levels of economic crime are. And, and if I could just describe economic crime, you know, it's if you just Google it, you'll get all kinds of different, uh, um, you know, definitions. But we term it as any kind of crime. Uh, I mean, in our in our circle, it's it's insurance crimes, financial crimes, um, uh, you know, banking fraud. Uh, th these are really the big areas for us: money laundering, anti-money laundering, uh, counterterrorism financing. Um, so traditionally, you know, mo most of um, uh, you know most individuals when we talk about economic crime, we think of you know the Madoff schemes, and, and yes, they are absolutely a part of this. But economic crime has so many different definitions and so many different uh, areas that, uh, that we have to uh, consider and take different, uh, different approaches towards. So what I'd like to do uh, now, as I mentioned, is, is just, just talk a little bit about the psychology of the economic criminal. So, so one of the, the important aspects to, uh, to keep in mind is that we're, we're talking about two different, very distinct types of criminals. So we have the organized criminal. So when we, when we develop a counter fraud approach um, and counter fraud strategies, we actually have to develop two 
uh, two specific approaches before we, or I should say two broad approaches before we can get into more minute details. Okay, so uh, firstly, we're looking at the organized criminal. Uh, and these would be, again, organized crime rings, terrorist cells. These are very, very dangerous, uh, large scale organizations with, with uh, you know, dozens or hundreds of individuals involved, um, usually highly structured. Um, you know, they're built like a corporation. There's, there's vice presidents and there's, there's low level runners and, and, uh, and everything in between. So these require a different, uh, a different approach. There's also what we call the opportunistic Fraudster. Now, what's very, very interesting is that the opportunistic fraud, fraudster is one uh, pretty much like it sounds. This is an individual that takes advantage of an opportunity. Um, so we know from other areas uh, in, in, in criminal justice and other studies that, um, that if, if given an opportunity, certain individuals will in fact take it. Okay, and It depends on uh, you know, the risk and reward uh, scenario, you know, that conundrum. So, so this is where the opportunistic approach is different than the organized approach, because what we find with a lot of the opportunistic criminals uh, is they tell us basically, well, you know what, I didn't think about committing that until the opportunity was presented to me. Um, I, I do, I'm an instructor for the, uh, the ATF, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearm, Bureau of Alcohol, Alcohol Tobacco, and Firearms, and um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that they do in their initial training is they actually bring in uh, several convicted arsonists. And I've had the opportunity to talk many times with, uh, with one in particular. We always end up doing training on the same day for some reason. But, um, and he tells me his story, and it's very, very intriguing. Uh, and it just confirms he, he is an opportunistic criminal. And he was never got involved in any type of crime uh, until uh, uh, there was a vulnerability within an insurance company. And actually, he, they made a mistake, and they sent him uh, a wrong check. Uh, a check in the wrong amount. So it was supposed to be for uh, $200. It was for $2,000. Um, so he had that moment, the, the, the moral dilemma um, in, in his, his, his personal situation at the time, uh, that, that extra money was extremely uh, critical for him. Um, so he went down that path. He chose, chose to accept that check. And long story short, that ended up, uh, that, that moment ended up ending in five years of uh, 20 different arsons, totaling over $7 million, uh, and unfortunately resulted in one death uh, in one of the arsons. And that's actually what, what made him turn himself in. Um, so, so again, he, he tells us, he confirms this, that he never thought about it up until that moment when that, that mistake was made. So we find this with a lot of other opportunistic fraudsters that they, um, they tell us that it wasn't until um, you know, uh, a certain cue, whether it was a first report of a, of a claim or incident or, or towards the end. And I'm talking specifically about insurance fraud right now. Um, so it's all about the risk and the reward. What we do know uh, about economic criminals is that they are, studies have shown that they are uh, more cognitive. Um, they usually have, you know, higher IQs. They, they can actually uh, differentiate between the 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 uh, you know the risk and the reward. So what what it behooves companies and agencies is to actually show that this is a high risk uh, type of crime. You know it is it is low reward and high risk. So and and actually unfortunately in the public it's it's seen as just the opposite. You know it's seen as a very high reward low risk because. Um, you know, we unfortunately hear of cases repeatedly of, of um, you know, such and such criminal, uh, you know, uh, have, uh, resulting in a lenient sentence as a result of an investigation or, or quite frankly, the, the prosecution decides not to proceed. Um, so, so we hear of these stories all the time. They're very disturbing and the criminal element does as well. So they know that you know what, maybe this, you know, committing this economic crime for 5,000 or 10,000 might get me probation, you know, uh, if that, it might not get me anything. So to, to a lot of these criminals, it's, it's actually worth that risk uh, because it's, it's so low. Um, we, we've interviewed uh, elements of the organized, uh, uh, or organized criminal elements, and they told us that this crime, economic crimes are easy, you know, because they don't have to worry about, um, you know, getting shot on the street 
uh, you know, while, uh, while, while committing some other type of traditional uh, organized crime, like or, or a crime to support the organized criminals like uh, extortion or, or kidnapping or something like this. They say this is easy because they can do it a lot of times by computer or over the phone or using technology. Um, so, uh, you know, the landscape is definitely changing and we see that, um, you know, on a, on a almost daily basis for us, uh, for us operating here. So, so again, we have to, you know, we have to educate a lot of our, um, uh, you know, a lot of our clients uh, and, and agencies on, on this difference, that there actually is a difference and it requires a different approach uh, to, uh, to preventative, uh, preventative strategies. So let's just talk a little bit about um, some some trends on a on a global basis. And so so what's interesting is that when you look at that global landscape, okay, you you can see why, why certain areas have spiked uh, in uh, in activity. So for example, when we talk about um, motor uh, motor premiums, you know what what you pay for auto insurance, right? It's very interesting because in certain areas where you find premiums are higher, um, you find more opportunistic fraudsters. Okay, and it's, it's really interesting if you think about this for a minute. What, what happens is the mentality of that individual, um, and, and this, this actually rings true to, to a lot of, of um, insurance products such as life insurance. Um, you know, again, we're talking motor here, but it could be property, it could be auto, it could be. Uh, dental, pet insurance, travel insurance, uh, any any uh, any type of business uh, contract uh, which requires a policyholder to make a payment uh, to to a company. What you'll find is when premiums are higher in certain areas, you'll find a higher propensity for those opportunistic criminals uh, to to want to recoup some of those premiums back. And it's very interesting because it becomes a entitlement theory. We call it. Um, where, where they actually quantify in their mind, you know, hey, I paid such and such amount over such and such period of time for this contract, uh, and I didn't get anything out of it. So um, I had a legitimate loss. Okay, so this is, again, going back to, to the opportunistic fraudster, most of them do have legitimate losses or incidents that happen to them, um, but they capitalize on it by by the, for this reason, you know, they, they will use that entitlement approach and, and think to themselves, yes, you know, I, I need to recoup back some of these premiums. So what you'll find is in these areas that have higher premiums, you have a higher incidence of opportunistic, uh, opportunistic fraud. Um, insurance premiums, we have high premiums here, depends on where you are. Of course, you're rated, uh, rated differently if you're closer to certain metropolitan areas. Um, we studies show that approximately uh, 10 percent. Um, 10 percent seems to be the standard as far as the number of actual claims submitted um, to to different uh, financial institutions that are that are fraudulent. So you think about that. That's pretty impactful. So out of 100 cases that are submitted, about 10 uh, studies show 10 have some element of fraud. Now I, I would beg to differ. I would say that's closer to 20 to 25 percent. Um, just due to uh, multiple reasons, um, you know, you, you have just so many little uh, factors that are involved in these um, uh, in these measurements. Um, so, so here's something interesting too that we're seeing is that um, a lot of companies are moving towards, you know, they have. So, so there's a difference in our approach or, or the approach to counter fraud in, in a company uh, that is. That, that is designed basically for profit, okay, uh, as opposed to a public institution uh, who, you know, could be a state agency, investigative agency, federal agency, military. Um, so what you find in the corporate or private sector is they have that conundrum between, you know, one, they have to investigate and, and prosecute and find all these fraudulent uh, and economic criminals, but secondly, at their core, they're really, uh, you know, they're designed to make a profit, right? So, so this is a conundrum, and, and it's very interesting to us when we actually get into some of these consultations because um, I've actually had CEOs tell me that, you know what, we're not concerned with this because this is part of our business expense, right? I mean, 
it's a fall off the chair moment, but this is what, this is what they tell us. And this is what I've heard. Uh, you know, they, 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 they had these losses and this fraud into their expenses because quite frankly, they tell us they don't want to deal with it. You know, they don't want to put themselves on the line and in investigating, you know, organized criminals and drug cartels. And they, they're just scared of it. So, so, so this is just really interesting as, as kind of a side note to mention. And, and what these companies do is they focus a lot on optimization of process, you know, whether it's, it's from, you know, initial stages of a reporting to, you know, whatever the, whatever the company does at their core, uh, they're all interested now in optimizing process, okay, using technology to, to really streamline and, and become profitable. So here, here's the problem here is that when you when you do that, you lose uh, you lose touch points with your customer. Okay? And and what happens there is you create gaps and opportunities for those opportunistic uh, fraudsters to come in. So what we find is that companies that really are strong on the optimization end, um, they that there is almost a, a direct relationship between their detection and their fraud rates because um, you know, opportunistic fraudsters realize this. Uh, they know that there's there's less touch points uh, that they and they can actually take advantage uh, take advantage of this process. So, you know, again, it's really uh, it's it's very difficult for us when we come into these companies to try to explain this to them uh, because um, you know, again, a lot of on the private sector, it's it's all about profitability at their core, and this could be a, a close second or it could be uh, not an issue at all. Um, but uh, sometimes we just have to do a lot of educating and uh, um, you know, helping them understand that this is just such a, a you know, more of a global, uh, global, uh, global problem. So what we see, these are strategies we, we start with, uh, with, with companies. So, and this, this goes back to the psychology uh, of fraud and, and, and talking about proposed strategies. I mean, we, we could, uh, I could list probably uh, 500 of them. Um, but these are just some that, that we know uh, that, that do work. So, for example, uh, companies that showcase powerful systems, you know, uh, they, 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 they make it known and, and public slightly or, uh, you know, on a larger scale that they have these systems in place, um, you know, to help detect fraud. And these could even be internal fraudsters as well. These could be internal employees. Um, but as long as these are showcased with, again, we're dealing with the, the economic criminal, uh, the, the cognitive criminal, the criminal that can weigh uh, risk and reward. When you show these powerful detection systems, um, you don't look as vulnerable. All right. So, so you make yourself a harder target. And that's actually not what they want. OK, so they might go elsewhere. And studies show that most of them do. OK, they'll find the weaker target. Okay, which is very, you know, common in, in, in a lot of uh, uh, criminality. Um, secondly, using honesty statements. So here's something that's very interesting. Um, I've seen some fantastic studies that that started uh, about five years ago. This started to be a, a kind of a, a hot topic in, in our area. And, uh, and it started in other uh, circles and tax evasion and, and uh, you know, even in the court system. Uh, about honesty declarations, and it slowly moved into the economic crime area, or I should say the economic prevention area. So what this involves is using an honesty statement, a declaration. And what it does is it actually uh, it, it, it makes the person uh, check in uh, on, a, on a moral and ethical base, basis for just a moment. Now, so we think of it, this is why we have, um, this is why we, we swear in a witness at the beginning uh, of, of their testimony. So what we found is using an honesty statement at the beginning of a document, uh, let's say it's a, who knows, a claim form or, um, you know, a life insurance form or, 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 or anything, anything related to that. If you use an honesty statement, it could be very simple. It doesn't have to, to, uh, to threaten legal action or anything like that. It's, it's, it's actually just the opposite. It's more to appeal to someone's inner morality. So if you just say something very soft, you know, uh, I've seen statements just saying, you know, hey, I do understand that everything I'm saying here is honest and truthful and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've seen studies that this actually has a, a, about a, a 25 percent, um, it shows a 25 percent reduction or increase in the, um, uh, the, uh, the honesty 
uh, remarks or results that that um, that you'll get. So a lot of companies are exploring this um, using simple uh, honesty statements. Uh, thirdly, sharing data is big, um, and and that's just kind of where we come in. Uh, you know, we, we try to streamline a lot of these processes. A lot of these companies and, and countries just don't know what to do with the data. Um, and and, and it's, it's very difficult because uh, in countries that, that have data sharing uh, regulations and rules, you, you definitely see higher, uh, higher rates of economic crime because, uh, you know, they really don't know what the problem is. You know, nobody knows what the, the you know, the other company's doing or, you know, the, the, the government agencies just don't have a clear handle on what is going on in their specific areas. So um, areas uh, areas of the world that, that are strong on, on sharing data, um, you know, showcase very strong efforts and usually have better uh, better results. And lastly, for global com uh, global companies, you know, one thing we see is that, um, you know, they, they often try a blanket or generic approach. So they'll have certain parameters that they'll try to implement in, in their different, uh, different countries. This does not work, quite simply. Um, you know, what works is having a framework, knowing what your vulnerable topics are. You start broad, uh, but then every country and even every region within that country has to be focused. Um, so, so this is a major mistake we see a lot of companies making is, uh, you know, focusing too broad and not, not really, um, uh, you know, keying in on the, uh, the details and, and what's needed in those uh, specific, uh, specific areas. So those are some, some global trends. So we'll talk, um, talk quickly about some things going on in different, uh, different areas of the world. And I want to leave some time for, uh, for questions. So, so here's what's going on in the U.S. So again, I, I, I talked about the impact uh, of fraud here, and, and really it's just because of the money. Um, we estimate, and again, this is just such a difficult number to quantify, about $11 billion is the annual cost of fraud. I mean, it's astronomical. Um, we figure it costs, and this is, this is, um, this is uh, areas of, of economic crime um, that uh, uh, focus primarily like insurance policies, life policies. If we start to, to get into even other areas, this, this could, even be, uh, could even be higher. So we know that it costs everyone here that's listening about $1,000 extra a year, um, which, is, which is pretty impactful, right? So you might be saying, well, where does that come from? Part of that is increased premiums uh, directly that you pay uh, in whatever contracts you might have. Um, second, though, uh, which is kind of a, a afterthought, though, is the increased uh, cost of goods sold that we that, that that are passed along to us through different areas. So, for example, the the uh, store that you get your groceries from, they might be experiencing certain increase in premiums, so they have to pass those costs to you. Um, so it's kind of a ripple effect, um, but uh, we estimate about a thousand a thousand per year. Um, we know uh, that, and I'm just going to go through, I'm not going to go through all these, but just some of the highlights that, um, believe it or not, about a quarter of the public feel that it's totally acceptable to commit any type of fraud. Okay, so one in four. Uh, now, now, I always, I, I always joke uh, because most of the, when I do presentations on this, it's, it's mainly a criminal justice audience, and we're all kind of, uh, <laughs> we're a little bit tainted in our views so, uh, you know, the, we're talking here the general public. So about one quarter of the people you cross, maybe in even other departments in accounting and business, one in four believe it's acceptable. Uh, so this is a problem, obviously, when you have that, that such, such high percentage of individuals thinks that it's okay. Obviously, um, you know, you're, you're starting off on the wrong foot uh, right off the bat. Furthermore, half of those feel that, it, that, that they would not get caught even if they, uh, even if they committed it. So couple those two together and, uh, and really what the public thinks is that most of the strategies that are out there are, are not working. Um, you know, you have more than half of those people thinking that they could get away with it. Um, then, then again, that mentality, that risk reward mentality just is not working in our favor. Um, we have a lot of uh, or organized uh, organized fraud, especially. So I had the great opportunity to uh, to, to learn the ropes in New York, which is <laughs> one of the uh, the highest exposure uh, areas to to operate in. Uh, we have a lot of um, organized criminal elements operating there. Uh, in the upper right hand corner, that picture that's that's uh, we, we, he was termed Russian Mike. That was his um, uh, street name. 
Um, we had, um, boy, I think, I don't even know what the quantified uh, uh, amount was when he, uh, when he was done with his schemes, but he was involved in, in just all kinds of billing medical fraud uh, type cases. Um, and uh, yeah, it was very, uh, very uh, detailed. Let me just show you quickly here what, what he did just as an example. So, so he was involved in these schemes where uh, involving uh, coding where he would, he, he owned maybe, I think, 20 to 25 medical facilities, all fraudulent, uh, all in New York um, and in close areas in, in New Jersey as well. And what he would do is when he would when he would send he, he would he would treat legitimate some legitimate and some illegitimate patients. But what he would do is he would he would follow a procedure called upcoding. Um, so so what would happen is I highlighted on the bottom there uh, when 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 you're allowed to bill. Uh, let's say like a code 99205, okay, which is basically like a basic office visit. You go see your doctor and they charge maybe $100, all right? Well, what he would do is he would actually upcode all these uh, to different uh, uh, different CPT codes. Um, so what would happen is he would actually build for, build for extensive exams and, uh, you know, uh, diagnostic procedures that were never even performed. So what happened with these is these would these would go through. Remember how I mentioned a lot of companies are looking to streamline process. Well, billing, billing to 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 a lot of insurance companies is I mean they can process a million claims a day uh, or a million line bills. So I mean talk about a process and an opportunity. So even if he got one in ten through, uh, his 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 profits were just just incredible. So, so these are the kind of things that we would do uh, with, with, you know, using some software as we could actually see here. Um, uh, uh, so, so what happened is this was a bill that was detected through a software package um, and, and it, would, it would send a flag and an alert to their investigative unit that, hey, you know what, this was upcoded. Uh, you guys might want to take a look at this because it was an extensive exam with just a very minor injury. So what we would do is we would couple that a couple of the, the CPT code, what they build with the diagnosis code. Okay. So without getting too technical, um, you know, if, if you have a soft tissue neck injury, you know, you should just have a basic visit, you know, um, but, but what would happen is these up codes would be a very minor soft tissue injury with extensive treatment and potentially, uh, you know, potential surgeries. So we could detect that here, uh, uh, as you see in this graph, and then these would, would be alerted in their, their special investigation unit. So this was actually a big part of the prosecution. We, uh, we ran a, a bunch of these um, uh, like tests, if you will, um, and, uh, and, and this is how they actually started to filter and, and really compile a case uh, on him. Uh, but again, it started off, of it. So, so he was targeting, I think, close to 60 different insurance companies. You know, but again, riding just under the radar on each each one. So, um, so that's just an example of um, of an organized crime case we we had here. And you know, looking back on these, I mean, uh, you know, these could have been avoided if preventative efforts uh, like that the, the technology systems were there. And and. That's really where companies need to go uh, because, you know, you need, well, actually you need a combination. You need, you need the investigators, the, the staff that actually knows what to look for, but you also need technology because you quite simply can't manually look through a million bills a day. You just can't do it. So uh, in this case, that's what really helped, uh, uh, helped prosecute, uh, prosecute this case here was a combination of those, those technological systems coupled with uh, strong knowledge base uh, from, uh, from the people. So that was the good old, uh, good old US. So let's move, um, let's move over into, into the Nordics. So it's very interesting when you look at the Nordic countries is uh, they are very traditional uh, in their, in their fraud approach, um, but they have an extremely high prevalence of fraud there. Um, so we find economic crime has spiked there in recent years. And one of the issues when you look on a global basis in the Nordics is that um, there are very few companies that operate there. Um, so you have to kind of put on your, you know, our business hat for a moment. And, uh, you know, we look at the market share. We see that that the top uh, the five companies own about 85 percent of the market share uh, of um, financial uh, of, of the financial sector in the Nordic. So 
this is good and bad. Uh, th- th- this is somewhat negative because if, if just these five companies don't believe in fighting fraud and don't believe in um, counter fraud efforts, uh, then, then, you know, you're really facing a, a losing battle. And that, that is somewhat the case in the Nordics because they just have very few companies that operate there and they're, they're just huge. Um, so, so now they're starting to be a trend uh, in the Nordics that they're recognizing uh, insurance fraud because a couple of very big cases have come through uh, in recent years um, uh, with uh, especially one in Sweden, which started about three years ago. And this was, again, an organized ring uh, with, with 214 staged accidents. Uh, and every single company, uh, they call them non-life companies, which would be just motor companies in Sweden was affected by this, which was incredible. So that really started kind of the uh, the, the mentality switch. Uh, and they realized that, you know, geez, we might need to start, uh, start doing something here. Um, so what, what's interesting is that the, the organized element knows this. They know that these companies are not putting any effort in here. And that's why it's such a big problem. I mean, we did one, one test with a, a company, um, one of the largest companies there in a life insurance uh, sector, and we found almost 40% of, uh, of their policies and uh, claims were, were questionable. So, uh, I mean, it's just, it's incredible the, uh, the impact really uh, in, in the Nordics that, that could be realized uh, there. Also, too, um, lack of law enforcement support. There's really no interest uh, there. They don't have any specialty units in the Nordics to help with this. Um, so um, there's really no support if they do actually find something and uh, you know dig this out and decide to take it to the next uh, next level. So we're going to move into areas, uh, uh, move into Japan and Hong Kong. So it's interesting. Uh, is that we have a big criminal uh, element, uh, the the Yakuza, which operates uh, in in these areas, very, very, very powerful. Um, So you have, you have this agency, uh, I'm not agency, this group pretty much infiltrated in in many areas uh, in the financial sector uh, in Japan and Hong Kong. So this makes it extremely difficult and extremely dangerous. Um, Whenever we do work here, uh, we we have, um, um, you know, many local contacts that we, uh, that we connect with, um, because, um, yeah, I mean, as, as soon as we arrive, I'm sure we, uh, uh, you know, we're on, we're on the radar. Um, and, and, and quite frankly, companies know this and, and they're, you know, they're afraid to be affiliated with, uh, uh, uh you know, with us for, for, for many reasons, but what, what we do find though, so here's our, here's our in, here's our little trick. Um, there's many companies that operate globally that have divisions in Japan and Hong Kong, so we can operate remotely. We're actually working right now in Switzerland um, with a company uh, on their uh, trends in Japan, Hong Kong, and even uh, Malaysia, uh, because we can work on a remote basis uh, with, with these companies because we have uh, the infrastructure to, uh, to do that. So this is kind of a workaround that we're, uh, we're exploring, uh, exploring right now is, is the physical and, and geographical aspect of, of fighting uh, this economic crime uh, from, uh, from a distance. But I mean, as far as uh, uh, quantifying it here, uh, we've seen estimates of, of about a trillion dollars. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's astronomical. Um, I mean, uh, we, we, we just, our initial tests uh, in these areas show uh, in the private sector, uh, show it could be, you know, again, closer to 25, 30% of, uh, of, of all of their content uh, is, is quote unquote questionable and being filtered into, into uh, these organized crime rings. So um, again, very, very difficult to operate in these areas. Um, you have to have the right people in the right places. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just a, it's, it's a very, um, uh, again, it's a very dangerous environment. So we have to be, be aware of that and companies uh, also Again, you know, they're focused on profitability at first. So, you know, they have to consider that in their, uh, in their strategies. The very, very interesting uh, uh, area to, uh, to explore. So Malaysia is the same. Uh, you know, we find uh, criminal element is very, very embedded here. Just one thing I wanted to point out, which is interesting about Malaysia, is they have, they have a two-part uh, system here, which is, is really, uh, it's really unique in that um, they have, uh, of course, um, regular policies, uh, again, you know, like we talk about the different lines of business, the motor, the dental, the property, things like that. But they also have more of an informal, it's called a tactical principle, which is based on 
uh, religious and cultural principles. And what it is, is it, it's basically uh, geographical. So you'd have a town uh, with, let's say, 200 or, or 2,000 2, people, and they will actually contribute uh, monetarily uh, to this fund. They call it the tackleful principle. And, and what, it, what happens is um, if, if someone suffers a loss uh, in that area, uh, they will uh, take money out of that pool and contribute. It, it's it's kind of interesting because it's it's where this business um, uh, kind of structure started back, uh, you know, two, three, five hundred years ago. Uh, but they actually operate this way and quite successfully. Challenging part to us is because it's such a quote unquote local um, uh, approach. Um, there's really no ability to penetrate or or to help or assist them because it's. Um, you know, it's very ingrained in their culture and their religion. So to come in and, and ask for, um, uh, you know, or to offer assistance uh, in, in different areas is, is um, uh, you know, it's not received very well. So, uh, but but the the fraud here is is absolutely rampant. Uh, we we know that by by some statistics that we've seen, and, and this actually is a problem, is because uh, there's not many uh, areas or, or companies that that actually measure measure here. So these areas are, are very intriguing to us. Uh, and these are on more of a mid to long range uh, strategy uh, on, uh, on a global basis. And then um, Italy. So we'll talk just real briefly about Italy. So of course, uh, we have uh, the organized criminal element in Italy. As, as I mentioned, the premiums here are very, very high uh, on many fronts. Um, it's very, very regulated as well. So it's very hard uh, for agencies and companies to come in and actually uh, uh, operate on a counter fraud basis. Um, they have strict data protection issues as well. So trying to share information is hard. Uh, they don't have much law enforcement support. Uh, so that, so there's, uh, there are agencies there, but they're, they're, they're very understaffed and overworked. Uh, so really, uh, it, it's a very, very difficult area and, uh, to, to operate on a counter-fraud basis. Um, and, and of course, the criminal element knows this. Uh, they capitalize on this. Um, and, and um, you know, we think, of course, because it's uh, one of the reasons why it's so highly regulated is because of the uh, connections maybe with, with the organized criminal element in Italy. Of course, it behooves them if it's highly regulated. So um, again, trying to penetrate here, we have, uh, you know, we do have some projects here, but again, they're very, uh, very problematic uh, for us. So Latin America, of course, uh, discussed this briefly. Um, one of the biggest scams in Latin America right now is death claims uh, um, and, and life insurance claims. So, and this all is all driven by technology. So the organized element is is pirating a lot of social security numbers and names and even even fabricating such things uh, and getting fake policies and then and then staging fake deaths uh, through uh, hunting accidents. That's a common one. Uh, now in, in Latin America, we're seeing and actually in other areas of Europe, um, where quite frankly, a lot of times there's nothing to hunt, nothing's in season, and then we're getting these claims come in. Um, so this is an area that we are focusing on as well. Um, but but again, um, you know, uh, the, the criminal element here is very strong. Um, you know, but uh, um, you know, we're we're still very active in uh, in our preventative efforts here in uh, in Latin America. So I left, I left the last few slides um, uh, uh, just talking about uh, careers and whatnot, uh, but um, uh, what I might do is just skip that. I know in interest of time and uh, uh, maybe open it up for, uh, for any type of questions. And I'll just end uh, really briefly here on the internet of things. So this is just basically about technology and how technology really is gonna be the, the game changer in the investigative world, being able to get data, uh, and do something with it, through all this stuff that's available through iPads and wearable devices and, and GPSs and black box technology. It's really where the investigation, the investigative world is going now. And, and the, the companies and agencies that are able to grasp technology and, and use all this are really, and, and couple that with, with, with good people uh, are really the ones that are at the, uh, the forefront here. So I'll just kind of wrap up really, uh, really quickly. Um, again, I, I, the main points I think I'd like to leave with is um, is just that that there is just such a distinctive difference, uh, and we're back in Colorado. That's such a distinctive difference between the organized and opportunistic criminal 
that requires different approaches. Um, and secondly, the difference between the white collar economic criminal and the uh, quote unquote regular uh, criminal uh, requires distinctive approaches as well. And what we see on the global landscape is, is one of vulnerabilities. You can almost predict what areas are going to be the focus and have higher crime rates and fraud and economic crime rates just due to certain factors uh, that make them a, a, a soft, uh, soft target. So I appreciate everyone uh, listening. Are there any, um, any questions or Rob, uh, anything? Uh... Well, nothing, uh, nothing on the chat so far. Um, my question, what, what's the role of Interpol in, um, in, in, in uh, this type of a crime? Yeah, uh, great question, Rob. So, so what happens is, and this is what's interesting, and, and this depends, um, it depends on the case, of course. Um, so, so when we have a, um, a you know a case that 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 becomes more impactful, you know, when we have, um, you know, when we're starting to get in the millions of dollars, and and we know that it will gain some attention, what we find, Rob, is that we have challenged. Uh, we have to start on a local uh, basis and then work our way into uh, into Interpol. So, um, for example, we have a case right now that we're working on um, in, uh, in Germany. Uh, with Interpol involved, but it had to start basically at the at the you know lower local level, um, uh, you know law enforcement and and, and legal departments, and, and we had to actually get in this way. We find that it's very hard to go to Interpol directly um, unless we have uh, other law enforcement agencies already uh, already involved. Uh, the UK is is fantastic with this. Uh, they have it in London. Uh, in my opinion, some of the best investigate economic crime investigators in the world. Um, so whenever we have a case in the UK, we know we're going to get some uh, some immediate ground, and we're actually working with Interpol on this because this one has um, uh, connections in probably about ten different uh, ten different countries. So uh, they, they they play an absolutely an active role. But what we find is that um, uh, you know we need we need more local cooperation first before we can, uh, we can uh, get them involved. Great, um, thanks, uh, Mike. The uh, Olivia Yu has a question. How is the public sector different from the private sector in fighting fraud in the U.S.? Yeah, su super question. Um, so, specifically in the U.S., again, the, the issue is again is that conundrum between profitability and uh, and prosecutability. We'll call it, and and really. You know, the, the private sector, uh, again, is focused firstly on profit. So, again, we, we know whenever we talk to anyone in the private sector that that's always in the back of their mind. You know, we could go in with the best case and all these, in, you know, uh, they're, they're going to get all this glamour and, and PR out of it. And, and really, at the end of the day, they're really thinking, well, that's great. But, you know, how is that going to affect us? Is it going to affect our, our you know, uh, the, the, the public's opinion of us? So that that's the, the perspective of private sector. Um Public sector, the, the issue becomes one of resources. Um, so the problem with white collar crime is traditionally it's not high on the prosecutor's list. So um, I personally, uh, I had one of the biggest cases of, of my career uh, go, uh, it went federal and, and we, were, we were just about to start to call witnesses and, and call people in and uh, lo and behold, a murder happened in the area. And, and I, I literally got bumped and the case never got heard. Uh, so, I mean, this, this unfortunately happens in the public sector. We understand, um, you know, the uh, the triage that needs to take place. Um, and unfortunately, on the public end, the white collar criminal is not seen as a, as a you know, a, a dangerous criminal, uh, one that causes significant damage, if you will. Um, so so that's the challenge in, in the public sector is actually getting more or uh, increasing the, uh, the awareness. Um, Michael, uh, another question. About private sector, seems private sector today, most of the uh, those big corporations have their own internal forensic unit, uh, either doing preventive or, or investigative work. So uh, do we have ideas about how, like a rate or among what they investigated, how many or the, the ratio of the cases that finally they referred to the criminal justice system rather than, you know, just handling it by themselves? Yeah, another super question. And, you know, I have to tell you, this is the problem because um, 
and, and I actually was involved in a, in a research study uh, here in that there is no universal measurement uh, of, of fraud. Uh, every single company, every single agency measures it differently. Uh, and this is this is one of the main problems uh, here because you can't quantify it. You know, I mean, murder rates, uh, you know, it, it, it's cut and dry, you know, uh, it, but, but, but in our area in economic crime, it's different. Um, what I would say, so, so two, I'll give you two answers. One is that officially there's no statistics we can go to. What I will say is unofficially, it depends entirely on the company's uh, um, in the private sector, the company's um, uh, theory or approach. So I've, I've had companies, one, one of the biggest companies that I worked for, uh, they did not want to prosecute at all simply because they were worried about their reputation in the public. They did not want to be seen uh, as, as policing and investigating their policyholders. And actually, if I could bridge this into Switzerland, this is one of the major problems with every company in Switzerland because they do not want to um, come across as, as you know, they, they want to create this bond with all their, their policyholders and all their people, and they want to keep their customers. So, um, I mean, to, to, to accuse, to, you know, uh, showcase a prosecution of your insured. And again, I'm, a, I'm the exact opposite. I think it has the, the, uh, the opposite effect and, you know, will create a deterrent. But um, a lot of companies look differently, um, look differently at that. So there's no set percentage, uh, Olivia. It really depends on the corporate philosophy. Thanks. Um, I think it's important to know, I get the sense, that private sectors are really not interested in prosecution, but recruit their losses, right? So, now, it's interesting, you know, we're in criminal justice for so long talking about uh, criminology victimization. Uh, in the past, that was almost 20 years ago, the retail industry, they take 5% theft for granted. <laughs> it's like, you know, that, that's expected. So now what's enlightening from what you said is for fraud today, they take 10% for granted, right? Yeah. yeah. And like I said, a lot of companies, unfortunately, and I, again, it, it just sends shivers down my spine. And I've, I've heard it a dozen times uh, from, from upper level management. And they will simply tell us, yes, this is padded in our losses, uh, you know, they tell us, so oh, we expect this, you know, this is part of our uh, strategic planning in the beginning of the year. I mean, it just, uh, from our perspective, we can't even understand why, you know, I couldn't even say that. <laughs> I, I wouldn't even feel comfortable saying that. So, um, yeah, so, so a lot of companies, this is their approach. You know, they don't want to be involved in this at all. And, uh, and, and this is where public awareness and increasing um, uh, you know, cooperation with a lot of public agencies uh, to, to get the word out and words and things like this. This is one thing we do here in New York. We have two specific agencies that are funded by the state that do that. They, they, they try to get that awareness out, you know, making commercials and, and things like that. But yeah, exactly. Some companies, they just simply don't care. Um, and and that, that really has a very damaging effect on the whole, uh, whole industry. Thanks, Michael. Um, I will have a last question, but I'll let others ask first. Hey, uh, Michael, what I would you know tell anybody who may be uh, see this presentation in the future is the graduate specialization, uh, law enforcement and fraud, uh, which is a fascinating combination, I think, for our students uh, that CSU Global offers. Yeah, yeah, Rob. Thank you. And actually, that was the, one of the things I wanted to talk about in the in the last little bit. And and uh, again, and and I'm a perfect example coming in. Uh, I did not expect to get uh, in in this industry. Um, you know, in, in my career, I started in, in a kind of a different area. Uh, but but the demand drew me here. And and uh, this is, in my opinion, the one of the absolute uh, hottest areas in CJ right now is is you know cyber crime, white collar crime. Uh, exactly. So yeah, with our programs, we've designed them specifically to take what we learn directly. Uh, I don't want to say in the market, but, but, uh, you know, directly applicable. So absolutely. Yeah. It's a real hot area right now. Okay. We have time for about three more minutes of questions, uh, here. So, uh, they want to have a, uh, a question or if not, we'll turn, uh, Olivia, I think has a follow-up. Okay, 
Anybody? If not, I'll ask my last question. Uh, Michael, I'm glad you mentioned Japan. Uh, I was I was really looking forward to some unique information about Japan because you probably know uh, in the late 90s, uh, last century, um, and we were very much criminologists, very much into Japan and thinking Japan after World War II was the model in preventing crime or low crime rate. So because, because of the culture that you mentioned, um, that Japanese culture is unique. Uh, although it's an Asian country, it's very different from others. It has high uh, level of guilt uh, when people are doing something wrong and they apologize, cry on TV, you know, CEOs. So I was thinking maybe their fraud is less, of course, we cannot quantify it, than other countries. Do you get that impression? I know Yakuza is, is a unique thing, organized crime, crime group there, but still, you know, they can only perpetrate so much yep. of fraud. So there are other op opportunities for fraud. Do Japanese generally sh shy away from it? You know, you know, what's funny is because we're, we're just starting to operate uh, in this area and uh, a close colleague of mine who has lived and worked uh, as an investigator there for over 40 years, uh, you know, including military, uh, very, very decorated, uh, he tells me it's a ginormous problem. <laughs> and this is right from the streets. Um, of course, I have no research. Uh, he's not an academic, uh, but he tells me uh, he works for six different uh, companies uh, in, in all of Southeast Asia uh, area. And he tells me it is just a, a huge problem. Uh, and he said it's it's just it, in the last few years, he said it really has become, uh, you know, organized crime has always been there. But he said in the last five years, uh, it has, has moved more into the opportunistic criminal or the, uh, you know, the quote unquote average Joe uh, that's committing the fraud. So I don't know whether there is a cultural change going on or, or just maybe it's it's a monetary draw. I'm not sure. Um, but again, I don't have any any studies to substantiate that, and that's what we're trying to penetrate, um, you know, penetrate now. And that's what's quite frankly very interesting to me. Uh, what, what all the areas I operate in, that's the one that's that's the most intriguing um, uh, on my end from a research perspective. So I will definitely let you know what I find, Olivia. <laughs> yeah, just keep in mind that that culture has a high level of shaming effect yep. you know so that that works very powerfully i wonder if it's changed a lot already no nope. thank you thank you thank you olivia okay uh michael i think we're uh we're done here thanks so much for your uh, presentation that was very very informative and uh the link will be available uh, on the faculty presentation uh website uh for those who uh weren't able to attend this lecture live Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Rob. Thank you.